pleasure. So in this video we're going to talk about Hesiod's poem Works and Days. Um, so this is a weird sort of compendium poem. Um, it's basically it, it's basically introduced as sort of advice to Hesiod's brother Perseus. Um, and he, he Hesiod sort of gives this framework a number of times um, that basically Perseus is this sort of lazy, no good, lying around guy. And Hesiod is this industrious farmer slash poet slash merchant kind of kind of person and so he's giving Perseus all of this advice about how to become more productive I guess um, so he, I, I, he says this a number of times and I like this one which comes uh, toward the uh, it comes a, a decent ways in but it, it's a good sort of state restatement of Hesiod's purpose he writes, I will speak to you as a friend, foolish Perseus. Inferiority can be got in droves easily. The road is smooth and she lives very near. But in front of superiority, the immortal gods set sweat. It is a long and steep path to her and rough at first. But when one reaches the top, then it is easy for all the difficulty. So again, the idea here is sort of teaching Perseus virtue specifically the virtues of hard work, the virtues of industry, the virtues of uh, religious piety, and things like this, which were very important in, in Greek society at the time that Hesiod lived. So these are all sort of crucial uh, moral lessons that Hesiod is giving along with a good dose of superstition, especially in the last quarter or so of the poem, there's just a lot of like, don't do these things because you'll be punished for it. And not like, don't commit crimes, but like, don't pee in the river or uh, don't fart in a, a, a mountain spring or things like this. Uh, plant on on these numbered days and not those numbered days within any given month. A lot of this sort of superstition stuff. Um, I mean, and some of it there's potentially good reasons for, but a lot of it is just sort of arbitrary. Uh, but part of the the central framework of uh, works and days is this idea that human beings live in strife uh, and and Hesiod introduces this idea pretty much right at the beginning uh, he says I see there's not only one strife brood on earth there are two so uh, in theogony he introduces strife as a as a particular goddess and says basically associates her with with negative suffering here he gives us a more complex picture uh, he says there are two types of strife one would be commended when perceived uh, the other is reprehensible and their tempers are distinct the one promotes ugly fighting and conflict the brute no mortal is fond of her but they are forced by the gods designs to do homage to strife the burdensome but the other was elder born of gloomy night and the son of Kronos, the high seated one who dwells in heaven, set her in the earth's roots much the better for men. She rouses even the shiftless one to work, for when she sometime, uh, for when someone whose work falls short looks toward another, toward a rich man who hastens to plow and plant and manage his household well, then neighbor vies with neighbor as he hastens to wealth. This strife is good for mortals. So basically, Hesiod's claim here is that when, when someone who's lazy or unproductive sees those around him who are uh, hardworking, industrious, and productive, when they, as they accumulate wealth, that, that the, the lazy, unproductive person is then motivated to go and become more productive. 
this of course doesn't always happen in real life, but this is sort of the this is a sort of ethical foundation for uh, for much of the way that that Western uh, philosophy has looked at the question of labor uh, throughout time. One of the the contexts that Hesiod gives us for understanding this question of strife and this question of why we need to work in order to accumulate resources uh, is his is his narrative of the different ages of the universe. So this is actually a really important and a really uh, foundational idea throughout Western civilization. Whenever anybody talks about a golden age, Hesiod gives us that idea. Um, so he says that initially there was a group of immortals uh, who, who lived on Olympus. This is the first age, the golden age, because these immortals were made of gold. Um, and everything was great for them, they were happy, they didn't have to work hard, uh, they lived by feasting, they never got old, etc, etc. Basically, life was good. Then you had a second race, the Silver Age, the Silver Race. Um, and they were, they were like eternal children who then sort of got to adolescence and basically were like, yeah, I don't care anymore, we're gonna die. So they did not do all that well. Then you had the race of bronze created by Zeus. Um, the men of bronze were warlike and militaristic and violent. They basically destroyed themselves without leaving any sort of records or evidence of their civilization. Um, so he actually says they were laid low by their own hands and they went to chill Hades' house of decay, leaving no names. So this, I, this idea, uh, this third race of men, um, was destructive, self-destructive. Then you have the Age of Heroes. So this is looking back at ancient mythology, even, even ancient from the perspective of Hesiod, um, who lived much closer to what would chronologically be the period uh, in which things like the Trojan War happened and uh, the conflict in Thebes around uh, the House of Laius, uh, the conflict um, of the Oresteia and things like this. If those things <laughs> had historically happened, uh, Hesiod's not all that far off when they would have been occurring historically. Um, but Hesiod is looking back on the heroic age as a previous age, an age that he is not uh, a part of. And then finally, he, sa he, he says, now we're in the age of iron, the iron age. Not the Iron Age that, like, archaeologists talk about as a distinct uh, historical period based on sort of human evolution, uh, society, civilizations, evolution through technology, but uh, the Age of Iron in terms of basically the, the hardness of existence, the, the suffering that goes with existence. So Hesiod describes this... Um, he says, would that I were not among the fifth men, but either dead earlier or born later. For now it is a race of iron, and they will never cease from toil and misery by day and night and constant distress, and the gods will give them harsh troubles. Nevertheless, even they shall have good mixed with ill. So basically, the age of iron is all about strife, is all about having to work hard to grow crops, um, being, being threatened with violence, being uh, surrounded by people who are corrupt, by people who want to uh, accumulate wealth and, and power without working for it, and then abuse that wealth and power 
uh, to to increase their status and things like this. So Hesiod's Iron Age, of course, we are still living in. Uh, the, the time of human strife has not ended, unfortunately. Um, but this is... This is Hesiod's framework, this sort of cosmological transition from one age to another as things basically get progressively crappier and crappier. But the other thing that's significant in works and days, the other thing I think is significant, uh, is, as we saw in Theogony, Hesiod is deeply misogynistic. And so, while in Theogony we had a very basic description of uh, the cre Zeus's creation of woman as punishment for uh, Prometheus, punishment for humanity because Prometheus gives uh, human beings fire, here we have a much more developed version of this. So we have this lengthy story of the creation of Prometheus, or of the creation of Pandora, actually. So this is where we get the Pandora's box story. Um, although for Hesiod it's a jug, not a not a box, but that's okay. Um, and it starts out here, uh, son of Iapetos, that's uh, Prometheus, and this is Zeus addressing Prometheus, Prometheus, by the way. Son of Iapetos, clever, clever above all others. You're pleased at having stolen fire and outwitted me, a great calamity both for yourself and for men to come. To set against the fire, I shall give them an infliction in which they will delight as they embrace their own misfortune. So that's Hesiod's description of women, uh, that men uh, will Im delight in embracing our own misfortune, uh, because women in Hesiod are sort of lazy, wily cheats who will try and trick you and seduce you and get your goods from you without actually doing any work and things like this. He actually says this uh, later. He's talking about trust and whether you should trust people in business. And he says, no ass no ass-rigged woman must deceive your wits with her wily twitterings while she, when she pokes into your granary. He who believes a woman believes cheaters. So yeah, a uh, very negative view of women does Hesiod have. He's, he's very invested in this idea that women are untrustworthy and unproductive. And so in that way, they're the direct opposite of the sort of ethical position that he's trying to to promote for his brother Perseus whom again he wants to be productive and honest and and pious and things like this